Opinions stated in this podcast should not be used as evidence. Assume that any cited evidence can be found in the related Candor Briefs releases. Thank you, and welcome to Former Partners. Welcome back to Former Partners Podcast. I am Lucas. And I'm Quentin. And today, we're talking about Extemp. Talking about Extemp, baby. We're talking about you and me. I've been thinking about that since we started looking at this outline. That's unfortunate. You didn't like that? Not at all. I I enjoyed it, actually. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying yourself. Yeah, today we're talking about Extemp. We actually have some cool features on the show today. Was we have some quotations from the 2017 National Speech and De- Debate Association Extemp Champion, the International Extemp Champion, Connor yeah. Rothschild. Connor Rothschild. He's not here. He's going to be on a future episode. Um, but we're we're good friends with him. Or yeah. Quentin is. I'm I'm an associate. Yeah, I I talk to him when I can. We're both pretty busy, but he was able to answer some questions for us about how to succeed at Extemp. So we wrote them down and hopefully can pass along the the wise words of the national champion to you guys. Yeah, so we're just going to be going down this like we did in our Intro to Public Forum episode. We're going to try to break down the different parts of Extemp, basically, in the categories. Right. And we're going to have Connor's feedback, and then we're going to have our take on it. And we're yep. going to do that for the whole thing. Yep, we're going to be looking at strategy start to finish from leading up to the tournament to right down to giving the actual speech so hopefully hopefully we can give some good insight lucas and i both did extemp through high school um at tournaments when i i only did it when a radio wasn't available because i was a radio guy i did it because apparently you can't just enter debate events so yeah our coach wouldn't let us just do a debate (laughs) so when love you brian if you're listening hope you are he probably isn't. He probably isn't. <laughs> he's got too much. He's way too busy. He has three kids. He has two kids. Two kids? Wow. I thought he had three. Wow. Didn't he have the third, like, right when we left? No, he, he had, had the, the second. second right when we left. You're right. Who Jeez. has three kids that I'm thinking of? Well, I mean, I'm sort of his third kid. Aren't we all? Yeah, he's actually got, like, 80 kids. Yeah, you're right. Enough, enough cruising the past and bringing up enemies. And bringing up memories. Let's talk about extent. Uh, the first thing we need wow. to talk about. <laughs> I can't stop. It's preparation leading up to the tournament. There's a couple good places to start, but obviously the first place you, you're going to have to start is with research. Uh, an extemporaneous speech is generally seven minutes long. It is almost always all from memory. At least it is on our circuit. It might be different There's in different actually, places. I read, I think in Texas, they allow you to use a note card. Really? That's interesting to me. That sounds like easy mode. Yeah. I had to remember stuff that I didn't even know in the first place. <laughs> a good start. I mean, what what I did was I, <coughs> I downloaded news apps. CNN. It would send me updates if anything big happened. You know. Mm-hmm. Did you do that? No. You just knew? Yeah. Yeah. No, I just... Uh... I did a lot of reading in my own right, I guess. I didn't really go to primary news sources. I would kind of just get sucked into like Wikipedia holes. Yeah. And just over time, after two or three or four years in the program, I had a pretty solid basis on a handful of international issues that you can tie back to most questions. Yeah. Which is a it's like a scattershot approach. Yeah. But, you know... It's important to note that right there you said after a few years in the program you had that. Yeah. Starting out, it is a really good idea to, you know, actually make an effort to learn about what's going on. In oh, for sure. Events. Especially if you're doing international extent, excuse me, rather than domestic extent. Yeah. Because there's just, I mean, there's over 200 countries in the world. Yeah. And <laughs> there's a lot going on. If, you know, if. 
something's going on domestically, you're probably going to hear about it. People talk about it. But you're not going to hear nearly as much about what's going on in other countries. Well, yeah, I, I remember specifically there was a, a several month recurring topic of the Chinese snake freedom fighters, I think is what it was, in northern China helping North Koreans across the border, kind of like an underground railroad situation. And it was a common, you know, every third question you pulled yeah. was that in international extent, but it was never once brought up on national yeah. news in the United States because right. it didn't matter to us. Right. There would be no, no realistic reason for that to matter to you in your day-to-day -day life. I think this is a good time again to bring up the distinction between news and news media. Yeah, very true. Because when you're doing this research, most of what you're going to pick through is going to be news media. It's going to be stuff that's going to be tinged with a little bit of opinion, a little bit of bias to try and make it sound better to, you know, one of our two major curtailed demographics that we have, demographics, excuse me, that we have going on right now. Yeah. Which is yeah, the right and the left. And most media is poisoned one way or the other to try and appeal to that group of people. And one thing that's going to be good at... um trying to filter that out is the recency mobile app when it comes out what's the recency mobile app again oh well lucas thank you for asking the recency mobile app is an app that we are developing to keep you updated on everything related to debate topics and uh extent topics in general there's going to be an extent section where you can choose international or domestic and then look at topics like conflicts or you know general topics under each area and it's going to bring back uh we're doing our best to make it unbiased. We're taking out sources like MSNBC and Fox News and and news media like the Daily Dot and that kind of thing. Okay. Um, so you get just a good set of results for everything going on around that topic as recent as you can refresh the page. And that's not to say that every writer from a news base that has some writers that have bias are all biased. There are good journalists inside of... Fox News. There are yeah. good journalists inside of MSNBC. Absolutely. The only reason we put them in with groups that need to be filtered, I feel like, is because we've gotten so used to the bulk of their content being tinted right. one way or the other. If, if it's big enough news that it needs to be reported on, they're not going to be the only one to report on it. And somebody else is probably going to do it with a little bit less bias. So that's, that's sort of the point behind trying to scratch out news media and go just to news you'll see a lot of stuff that is hyped up for entertainment value now when it comes down to the actual research itself uh there's areas like genres almost of research that you can do for both international and domestic respectively a couple ideas for international uh you could start with just general diplomacy slash world leaders so Try to figure out which countries are on each other's good sides, which ones are on each other's bad sides, you know, who leads different countries, because you never know when you're going to get a question about the president of Swaziland, and you may not even know who that is, and you may not have an article that mentions their name, and you're not allowed to use the internet, so you have to go give a whole speech on the president of Swaziland, not even knowing what that person's name is. Exactly. And that's... That's brutal. You don't want to be caught in that situation. Yep. So brushing up on who leads what, who's important where, who likes who, who doesn't like who, that's a really good place to start with international. I think that trade is important because two countries can really not like each other. They can have bad diplomacy and still trade effectively, right. yep. i.e. the United States and China. Yeah, I was going to say that. We have a major disagreement constantly with our ideals and how we agree that our cover governments should be functioning and yet we still trade with them as our largest trade partner every yeah. year because we're able to come to trade agreements and we have yeah. departments that do that. So yeah, see who's trading with who, what they're trading about, why they're trading. How trade is going. Yeah, if it's good, if it's bad, if there's a tariff, if there's the, not. The entire global market, really. Yeah. Um, global economy is huge. Look at your conflicts. So going back to that diplomacy a little bit, if two countries don't like each other, are they at war right now? Or are, are they just mad? Are they skirmishing on the borders and it's leading up to war? Are they just mad and they're tariffing and sanctioning the crap out of each other? Right. Or is there, you know, 
is Saudi Arabia fighting Houthis in Yemen? You know, is there an actual conflict and war happening? Um, also things like human rights in other countries. For sure. Again, talking about Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia committing human rights violations against Yemen civilians and Saudi Arabia's own citizens. You know, that's important for you to know about if you're going to be potentially be potentially talking about Saudi Arabia, because you yeah. might get a question that's like, is Saudi Arabia fit to lead the United Nations Council on Human Rights? Right. And if you don't know about all their abuses because you don't have that information, you might go in there and be like, yeah. And then the judge will be like, no, yeah, they, they, they stone people still in the streets and they See, spray their citizens with sarin gas. It's so important to know backgrounds of countries because there's evidence for everything. Do you remember, let's not say the name. Are you talking about Canada right now? Yes. Oh no, man. Do you remember, what, was that sophomore year? Yeah. A certain teammate. Who will not be named. Went into, uh, I think it was domestic extent. It was a domestic extent round. She got the question, who is the biggest threat to the United States? And she said Canada. Because a couple veteran members of the team that were upperclassmen at this point convinced her that Canada was the largest nuclear threat to the United States right now. She had some evidence behind it, talking about Canada alone, not Canada's relationship with the U.S. She had no concept of, you know, the background relationship there. And that's the important thing, is learning background. Yeah, if she had understood that Canada and the United States have been allies for over a hundred years already, then she wouldn't have gone in there and given that speech. But because she didn't have her basic research background that you need, she got the wool pulled over her eyes and she looked like a fool in the debate round, in a extemp round. And not her Love fault. her to death. She just didn't know. Yeah. She, she was a good debater. She just... She was just young and hadn't, <coughs> hadn't done enough research behind it. Yeah, for sure. Had a, uh, had a bad time. Yeah. Another important thing is European politics. Oh my god, yeah. I hate Europe. I don't actually hate Europe. If you're from Europe and you're listening to this, I love you because you're listening to our podcast. When I say I hate Europe, what I actually mean is I dislike the complexities of the European geopolitical system. Because there are many. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of them. Yeah, for sure. Because, like Brexit, we were talking about this before we started the recording today when brexit came up it wasn't just questions about should brexit happen it was how does greece feel about brexit how does the effects of brexit on literally every yeah how does france feel about brexit how does great in great year or whatever it is great britain there we go yeah. feel about brexit there was yeah. a solid like month and a half or two months where probably 40 percent of international extent questions were about brexit and it just got annoying but if you knew about Brexit and you knew European politics, you had every speech down, at least for that period of time. So, yeah, they're the, the best way to prep you for international extent is to tell you to learn everything. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> everything about every country in the world that's going on in hopes that when you draw your question, you might have an inkling of what's going on in the context of it. Otherwise, you're going to be up a creek without a paddle often. Now. When you're actually gathering that research to put into your extemp file, I recommend cutting whole whole articles, just straight up the whole text of the entire article, yep. going back through and just highlighting the important paragraphs that stick out to you. Yeah. Just like you would a piece of evidence for a debate type, just do it extemp style. It's a very useful tool. If you do that with three or four articles a day for each week, and you try to diversify your genres between, you know, diplomatic situations, trade situations, war situations, right. specifically European politics, specific, uh, specifically Asian politics. By the end of a month or so, you're going to have a pretty solid file, let alone by the end of the year. And a, a great tool to use that I loved was there's a, a Google Chrome extension called TLDR. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, TLDR would just, you would click it and it would, scan through the article and it would give you about a paragraph explanation of the important parts of the article it would also if it was a very photo heavy article it would pull just the text from the yep. entire version so that way you could copy and paste it really clean yep it was awesome so 
if you use Chrome, download TLDR, give yeah. it a shot for debate stuff. You might like it. That's a, it was very helpful. Now switching over to DX, domestic extemp or US extemp, some important things to know are obviously United States politics, mm -hmm. Congress, uh, president, you know, all the different branches, what's happening there. Um, for example, the state of the union, I'm sure that this weekend, if there's a tournament, there's going to be quite a few questions about the state of the union. Would you agree? Yeah, they're going to be, how did president Trump's state of the union address go? Did president Trump affect or reach the target demographic he was looking for with his state of the union address? Right. What impact will, did his state of the union address have? Yeah. Will his address cause any change in the United States? All sorts of stuff. Yep. And it's a way to prep for that it was just to watch it really. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's where more preparation leading up to the tournament comes from. If you know, there's going to be some big four hour Politico ordeal that you can watch. It sucks, but watch it. Yeah. <laughs> You'll learn more in that four hours than you will from reading through 12 hours of news articles about it. Yeah. Another important thing is economics. Obviously, you, you want to know, is there a recession coming? How is our debt doing? Uh, what what does the just the entire economic picture look like for the United States? There are so many questions about economics every all the time. Because it's such a, you know, it's important, and it's it's a good question to have an extent. Well, it's like half our policy that we make right. domestically is yeah economically based, or yeah, at least for the purpose of it. Uh, you're also going to want to know stuff about celebrities in the United States, because unfortunately, we think that how people like Johnny Depp and Oprah spend their Sunday afternoon is an importance to yeah. extent and questions. That, and that may have just been our circuit, but I remember so many like Ray Rice yeah, questions. Yeah, no, for real. Whenever somebody who has a lot of money in the United States does something wrong or becomes just the subject of public opinion for some reason, it becomes an extent question domestically. Yeah. I'm, I, it's not my place to say whether it should or shouldn't happen, but it will happen. Yeah. So you should be ready for it. Yeah. Um, national disasters or, or crises Things like hurricanes or uh, like Flint, Michigan. I remember when Flint, Michigan happened. Well, yeah, there was a there was a hurricane in Florida not that long ago, right? Yeah. yeah. And since that is those are both domestic issues, you need to know at least the background to these. Yeah, because you get I mean, right after those events happened, you were getting questions like, should President Trump allocate FEMA funds to Florida to aid with hurricane relief? Right. And now you're going to be getting stuff like. Did the allocation of FEMA funds by President Trump actually yeah. aid Florida hurricane relief? Really exactly. Or should President Trump have allocated FEMA funds to aid Florida hurricane ETH because hurricane relief because it's after the fact now? Yeah. But that stuff's just going to keep popping up. And it was something really quick I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, because I was talking about keeping your extemp file, you know, doing three or four articles a day throughout the year, and by the end of the year you'll have a big file. That's not all useless when the next year rolls around. Right. Because unless something new on that exact same topic comes out and sets the precedent for recency, you know, like there's new information about something, you have the most recent information about that topic at that yeah, point. Exactly. So you can roll your extent files over year to year. And that's why this research really isn't as daunting as it seems that yeah. by the end of one year, you know, you're going to cover all your major topic areas. You're going to have a good foundation. By the end of two years, you're going to have a substantial amount of bulk. By the end of your four-year high school career, you're going to have such a large extent files that you could probably start a career in international politics. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> some people use um, some people use services that send out extent files. And if you do, that's okay. Um, but it's still important. All of these things, it's still important to have a good basis of background knowledge for all of these. Even if you don't cut your own extent particles, which I think you should, but that's neither here nor there. You should at least have some knowledge over these topics before you read the articles. If you've got any great resources that you use for extemp and you feel like sharing them, put them in the comments down below and upvote the one that you like the best if you see another one on there that you like or that you also use yeet big yeet i would like to see our most upvoted comment on this video be the top resource that everybody kind of voted on because that would be cool i like your outreach lucas i just think it's important to keep 
our audience involved, regardless no, of if it's 50 people or a thousand people or a million people. I just feel bad. We do this every time and I can't help but think about the people that are just like listening on the podcast app on their phone and they're like, I can't comment or anything. Yeah. If you're listening on one of the applications where you can't give feedback, shoot us an email at uh, formerpartners at gmail.com at formerpartners at gmail.com and oh. we'll do our best to address any feedback you give us on the show if it's relevant or if you want us to if you just want to give us a shout out that's fine too we love all the love you pointed at me and I was looking at the screen and I didn't see you pointing at me so I was like uh what oh I always have Quentin do the social media information because he actually manages the accounts and I don't want to mess up the tag by not including the the 69 or the 420 that's in there with yeah. it so right so the next question would be whenever you're double entered, because a lot of people double enter extemp and uh, some sort of interpretation event, mm -hmm. is it better to be first or last? Because it, a lot of times... Do you mean by that, is it better to do extemp first or last uh, rather than your other event? Or is it better to be first speaker or last speaker? First speaker or last speaker. You don't have room. any control over that. Some, yeah, you do. No, you don't get to decide if you're the first extemp speaker. Those schedules are predetermined before tournaments even come out usually. No, you can no, you can go in into draw and say, hey, I'm double entered. Can you move me up? And they will. Oh, yeah, I guess some tournaments do do that. Yeah. Well, I mean. If, if you have the opportunity, is it better to be first or last? First, you should always do. I feel like you should always do extemp first and be the first speaker if you're double entered. I agree. Because... It's the only event at the tournament that actually has to run on schedule and it has nothing to do with the lengths of the speeches and it has everything to do with the fairness for all the competitors. If you're yeah. the if you decide to go last in your room and you're double entered in your HI room, you're also like third or fourth, you know, and then you get there and it's seven minutes past when your speech is supposed to start. They shouldn't let you go. Yeah, you just got an extra almost 10 minutes of prep exactly else did. and yeah you were performing your other event and it's unlikely that you were doing prep for your other event while you're performing your other event but all that extra time in between it, it adds up because the whole point of extemp is you had 30 minutes to prep this speech and then give it so if you find any way to stretch that out you're, it's not cheating it's just unfair right yeah no I, I agree i think if if you have the opportunity you should last is better than in the middle i think Mm -hmm. but first is ideal if you have the if you're able to make it happen yeah if you're in two events you should do extent first if you can go for second or third you'll be fine if you can't go for second or third for some reason because all seven of the people in your room are double entered and you're slow then try to go very last and try to go be first in your hi room i guess yeah but even that's kind of risky so and never uh, always remember to write on the boards in the rooms that you're double entered just so people are aware yeah just in helps. case something does happen well, because it might be a first time judge yeah and if they're sitting in there and they're like i've had six people go but i've got seven people on the schedule and you didn't write anything on the board they might wander out of the room and then by the time they're able to get them back in there and it's time for you to go the debate rounds have already started so then you're late to your debate round and, and you just nightmare. got a seven yeah i think i just like probably caused some ptsd for some of our listeners because yeah. they're like i've literally had that exact thing happen to me yeah <laughs> so whenever you go into draw and they call, you know, your your room or your draw or whatever you want to call it. And you're looking at the three questions in front of you. How do you go about choosing your question? I pick the one I like the most. Yeah. Connor Rothschild, 2017 NSDA International Extem Champion, says he always chose the question he knew most, most about unless it was a super polarizing question like if he knew a lot about it but it was something like hey should we raise taxes he would move to something else or if it was like hey do you think we should keep letting women kill babies right yeah. something like that or like Im immigration should yeah. we build a wall you know if it's going to be something that so many people are so hot about he would move to something else even if he knew the most about that one I understand that. I mean, if your purpose and extent especially is to be successful and to mimic a national forum speaker like what an extemporaneous speech kind of is, then that would be accurate. Right. You, If you're trying to be successful, you pick the question you know the most about, unless it's super polarizing and you think it's just going to hit bad. And 
then you give your speech. Yeah. But I, I didn't really follow that methodology because I wasn't necessarily trying to be successful in extemp. I was just trying to enjoy myself. Yeah. So I would literally just pick the topic I thought I could have the most fun with. Right. And by have the most fun with it, I don't mean give the most ridiculous speech. I mean, give maybe the most unique solution to a problem or an interesting speech, maybe yeah. about something that nobody's ever really thought about or heard about. Right. You weren't, you weren't necessarily going for the win by giving the answers you knew would be. Yeah. Mine was more info than it was extemp. Honestly. Right. I, I think I would agree there. I am. Um, I would go, well, one, if there was a question and there always is somewhere, if there was a question about, you know, the current debate topic, I would go for that one in a heartbeat. But other than that, if it was something that I just was familiar with, that was good enough for me. I'd sort of had the same approach as Connor. I mean, I think that's generally what we do. There's There shouldn't be super polarizing topics in extemp. The extemp question writers should know that. But sometimes there are. Yeah, and it's not a bad idea, especially if you're looking for that first place spot to avoid the polarizing questions for sure. I think I agree with Connor on that regard. Yeah, that can just totally kick you out in the judge's eyes. But that's for uh, choosing the question, though. So really, just pick one that you think you might know about or pick one to have fun. or But yeah. take it seriously no matter what. Yeah. Now, after you choose your question, you've got 30 minutes. That's the clock. Yeah. <sighs> just tick tocking away at you. What do you do? Splitting up that 30 minutes. Ideally, if you can, <laughs> write your speech in seven minutes, and then you have 23 minutes to practice your speech three times. So you have 21 minutes to practice your speech three times, and then two minutes to walk to your room. Yeah. That's the most ideal I can say to somebody. Now, that's a perfect world where you can write your speech in seven minutes. I don't think everybody can. Yeah, I think a more realistically realistic would be 15 and 15. Yeah, 15 minutes writing, 15 minutes giving it. That gives you two speeches. You can give it while you walk. Yep, and a minute to get to your room. Yeah. If you have to, break it up the opposite direction. Do 21 writing, seven minutes running it, three yeah. minutes to walk the room. Just try to work in increments of seven minutes, and I think you'll find more success. Yeah. Just because. I mean, there were some times where I would choose a question that I thought I had evidence on and I didn't and so I spent pretty much the entire 30 minutes trying to find something or anything you know and those weren't great speeches but you have to do your best to at least give yourself a one run through of the speech so it's not just still a rough draft when you walk in there and are looking at the judge for sure so yeah most ideal is probably 50 50 15 minutes of prep 15 minutes of practicing your speech but Realistically, the important part is just give your speech at least once before you go to the extemp room. Yeah. I think that's... That, yeah, ideal would be... If in a perfect world, you write your speech in less than 10 minutes and have a chance to give it three separate times. But realistically, 50-50 is probably the best approach. Yeah, I agree. But then you're probably sitting there and you're like, well, Quentin, I know how to spend my prep time, but... I don't know how to write the actual speech itself. What what goes into a good extemp speech? Well, there are some very important elements of a good extemp speech. The first being your introduction. This is your first chance to grab the judge and audience attention. Now, the question is, should your introduction be a canned intro or a, a unique abstract intro? Personally, I always went with weird abstract intros. What, what did you do? I had canned abstract intros. <coughs> yeah, let me rephrase. I used the same exact abstract in introduction every time. Yeah, so they were super canned, but they were weird at their basis so that it was unique pretty much no matter what. My favorite, I think, still is J. Robert Oppenheimer's I Am Now Become Death, Destroyer of Worlds. Because you can tie that into so many things about responsibility or about slippery slopes. Yeah. Or about the dangers of the unknown or just so many different things. And it just, it has that kind of biblical sincerity to it that I really like that seems to make people listen. Yeah. And, you know, some people, whenever we say canned, we mean, you know, a, a Martin Luther King Jr. quote or a, a Mark Twain quote 
connecting it to the question, et cetera, et cetera. Not canned is anything really outside of that. Yeah, if you if you start with a story and then you tie the story back somehow, because even using something from Martin Luther King Jr. or from Mark Twain isn't necessarily canned if it's like an excerpt or an anecdote from their life and then you tie it back. But if your introduction is literally Mark Twain once said words, those words tie to the topic. Now let's go. That's that's a canned intro. And that's not bad. That's just what we were referring to it as. Right. And, you know, I actually my my quote abstract weird introduction was always I would try to break the fourth wall with the judge and I would start my speech by saying 30 minutes ago I was asked this question and it made me think uh, da, 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 da. yeah I would just be I would I wouldn't try to act to the judge like I was some important thing I was just a kid in extemp and 30 minutes ago I got this question here's what I came up with you know see I think I took the exact opposite approach <laughs> I would and always I tried to make it sound like mine was very grim and dire and like you had to come away with something from my speech. See, that's just the difference in our personalities, because I would I always got a little smile or a little laugh out of the judge using that approach. And I'm I, I don't know if I've ever been serious a single second in my life. See, I was looking for nostril flares or eyes bugging out or somebody reaching in and grabbing their cross you know <laughs> having a panic attack <laughs> yeah i wanted yeah. them to really think that what we were talking about was something that was about to happen to them if they didn't listen and pay attention right but that was just interesting my yeah yeah that really is totally evident like the difference in our personalities wow this isn't time for revelations about our personal relationship quentin sorry but yeah, that's your intro. <laughs> Whether um, or not it's canned or not canned, there's not a right answer here. We both went with not canned. You might go with canned. It's just in, important to consider an introduction either way. Yeah, I mean the the key is what is gonna what you're most confident doing, um, which we'll talk about a little bit in a minute. Um, we're also gonna talk about how to do your your points mm -hmm. in a second. But let's talk about sourcing. What was your approach to sourcing? Because mine was really one is this recent are you asking like if i would use a source or how many sources i would use what's your just in general those things and more you know i mean yeah i would look for recency because if somebody said something yesterday it's going to sound a lot better than if somebody said something in 1955 right just because unless it's an oppenheimer quote yeah unless it's an oppenheimer quote uh i would look for authority in the t in the author right because, like I said, my whole approach to extemp was to make it sound like a real issue that was pertaining to the judge. So if my source was the, the uh, I'm trying to think of the word, Secretary of Defense, then that's a pretty good source. Yeah. That provides some dire you know, context to the situation from an right. actual government official. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just the, your normal debate stuff that you would do. Look for authenticity, look for authority, look for recency... Yeah, I mean the 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 more important the figure and the more recent the evidence, the better. Essentially. Um, but I know at least when I'm judging, and this could just be me, but whenever I'm judging extemp, I actually tally how many sources I hear. No, I also do that. Uh, in theory, you should be reading a new piece of evidence during an extemp speech about every 90 seconds. Yeah, at least within your points. You don't need evidence in your introduction or anything. Exactly. Like and it, Although you can use evidence as an introduction. That's another thing yeah. I've seen people to do is they say, you know, Time Magazine and an article about blah, blah, blah last mm -hmm. week said this. And uh, that's, that's what's going to lead us to our yeah. question today, which is right. blank. But yeah, I will totally... Things I'll take into account when I'm judging are one time, two sourcing. Um, so I'll look at how many points they had and how many sources they had. And if there's less than like two sources per point, you know, that's sort of a, a take off the off the overall points for me. Uh, I mean, realistically, I think because it's a seven minute speech, you should be clearing your intro within 30 to 45 seconds. Right. So that means you've got like five minutes to do your points five and a half yeah with know. about a minute outro if we're doing 90 seconds for every single piece of evidence within that realistically 
You're looking at about one source per point if you have three points. Well, you could be doing two. You could be doing two good sources per point. They'd be faster than 90 seconds, though. Well, yeah, well, it's it's like 60 to 90 seconds. Yeah. This is just numbers that my coach gave me, too. This isn't yeah. like the standard. You have to do it this way or you're bad. This is just what I've been taught to be an ideal extent speech. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I mean, it's, you know, I don't vote people down if they don't have enough sources. It's just sources are a big thing for me when I judge. Oh, well, they're important to extent because otherwise it's just the uh, flippant words of a high school student. Yeah. I mean, if, if I like the speech and you're making sense and you seem confident, um, I'm not going to be as hard on you for not having so many sources. And on the other side of that, if you're not an amazing speaker. And you're taking a controversial viewpoint. But you have good sourcing <laughs> and it's consistent. Um, you know, you're going to be you're not going to be as low down in my book as you would be. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Um, but with sourcing, just make sure you're getting them out there. It's really important to get your sources out because especially at higher levels of extemp, when you're at districts, when you're at nationals, they're going to be counting your citations. They're going to yeah. be, a lot of them are going to be looking it up as you say it, right. even checking uh, and making sure it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. So give those clear and confident, you know, moving to my first point about blah, blah, blah. This comes from, Jones, a writer for the Atlantic in January 15th, 2018. Yeah. Like give the whole thing and you'll be fine. Yeah. I, I wouldn't worry horribly about it. If it seems, if it seems like a spot where you should throw in a piece of evidence, throw in a piece of evidence. Yeah. If you have it and you know it then do it, you should, you, there's no reason not to. Basically anytime you're making a claim that like a high school student would have trouble backing up with just their credibility alone, throw in a piece of evidence. Yep. And Connor Rothschild chimes in again here, just about the speech overall, how to give a good extemp speech. He says the biggest component of doing well is charisma and confidence. You just have to make your judge think that you know what you're talking about and be familiar with the topic material. That requires a lot of work on the front and front end outside of tournaments, doing a lot of reading and research in your free time, which leads back to that preparation for the tournament. Yeah, yeah. But like we said, like he said, the biggest thing. Is charisma and confidence if you don't seem like you believe what you're saying then nobody else is going to either just like our poor unfortunate classmate who got tricked into talking about canada being a nuclear threat to the united states yep if she'd gotten there and she'd given that speech confidently and acted like she knew what she was talking about and even read some more evidence she might have been able to win the room still yeah even with a totally unfounded viewpoint but she seemed unsure on an unsure viewpoint and it just ruined it yeah it it was really not a good time. So let's talk a little bit about speech structure. Speech structure? Yeah. Wait, huh. you're telling me I know the intro, and I know that I need to have points, and I know that I need to include citations. What else is there? There's a few different structures, a few different approaches to actually um, giving your speech. Connor says the most important part of speech structure is being cons consistent with a clever theme throughout. Um, then following the basic structure of a good attention-getting device, three main points, conclusion, etc. So Connor went the straight and narrow route that pretty much everybody goes down. A good theme, um, a good introduction, three main supporting points, and conclusion. That's the default. It works. It's tried and true. You know, that's... That's how a majority of people do it. And when he says something like a clever theme throughout, that can be something as simple as your transitional language. Yeah. If you give a maritime story for your introduction, then using transitional words like, now let's drift over to our second point. Right. And, oh, let's do the backstroke on over to our third point. You know, it's it's <laughs> yeah. cutesy. It's, it's stuff that you wouldn't expect, but it's thematic, and it's going to make your speech memorable. Yeah, and your judge is, is going to like it even a little bit. Your judge is going to be like, okay, there's a little bit of effort in here. Yeah, yeah. like they were trying to make this seem like a polished, complete prof product, which right. is what they're, they're doing. And they're trying to make me enjoy it, which is key. So the typical speech is your advocacy, which is, whenever I say advocacy, I mean your introduction and then your answers to the question. So the typical speech is advocacy and then three main points. Now, there's also something called MEPS, which I never did this, but I like the approach, so I wanted to bring it up. It's your advocacy and then you have four points. Um, you look at your advocacy from one, a morality standpoint, two, an economic standpoint, 
three, a political standpoint, and four, a societal standpoint. I think that's an interesting way of doing things. Yeah, I like it. Um, so by advocacy in this, I think it's really referring to your... Your stance. Your stance on the topic, yeah. yeah. So should China invade the United States military bases in the South China Sea? Well, we're going to be taking the stance of no today for the following four points. One, morality. Two, economics. Three, politi politics. Four, societal impacts. Right. And then you can actually look through your answer in four different scopes. And if the goal of an extent speech is to answer the question effectively by looking through four different scopes like this and giving an answer in four different contexts that you can tie all together and put a nice little bow on top with your thematic AGD, that's going to be a good speech. Yep. Um, it, it gives you a chance. One, these, these sort of structures are good to have if you can't do the typical advocacy and then three supporting points. That's the straight and narrow approach just because, you know, that shows the most support for it. If you have three different areas of answering the question, we should do this because A, B, and C. If you can't find enough points like that, then you can look at it through a theoretical lens of if we do this, what are the moral impacts? What are the economic impacts? What are the political impacts? And what are the societal impacts? And it's a really good approach um, to one, give a good explanation of your stance and two, answer the question thoroughly, like Lucas said. Now, as interesting as that is, that's not what I did. That's not what Lucas did. We preferred a, a different structure, which I think, honestly, I've told people this structure before. It's so simple and it works so well. It's the, I call it squawk. Um, I call it PSO rather than squawk. And all that is, is an acronym for problem solution outcome. Squawk is status quo advocacy change. So it's, They're very it's the similar. same thing. Yeah. yeah. Just different terms. Essentially what you do is your first point, your entire first point is just background to the situation. Yeah. Why is the question a question? Right. So if it's about, uh, what, what are you talking about? Chinese inv invading? The, yeah. Chinese snake freedom fighters. Yeah. So the background, your first point would just be explaining who they are, what they're doing, why they are doing what they're doing. And then your second point is advocacy. Your second point is where you actually answer the question. Um, in Lucas's terms, this would be the solution point. Yeah, this because for me, it's like if a question makes it into extemp, there is a problem identified by it. Even if it's a how, there's a base issue that is trying to solve and you can give a solution. Right. Which is your answer, your stance, your advocacy, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And within the second point. Whenever you're giving your solution or your stance, you take this time to, one, explain what your stance is, two, explain how it will happen. You know, if you're talking about the Chinese snake freedom fighters, whatever they are, you'll talk about what their approach will be, why they will approach it this way, et cetera, et cetera. And then your third point, the change or the outcome point is what effects this has on the, on the status quo what the end result is after you explain your solution or advocacy. Yeah. And this is where I think it ties back into our speeches being more informative rather than right. extemporaneous that we were trying to outline a problem given to us by the like by the question. Yeah. Give background on it to try and make sure everybody's on the same page, dive into the problem actually outlined and then give our solution to it. Yeah, and again, this is this is the approach I took, one, when I was starting out and I wasn't good at extemp, and two, on questions where I didn't really have enough to make just a normal advocacy and then three-man point speech. This is really the approach I always took, but again, I didn't have the same goals and extemp that some of you may have had. Right, but it, it is a good way to fill time. You, using this structure, you will hit seven minutes. For sure. The the history lesson time suck of your first point can take as long as you need it to. Yeah. I mean, I would, you know, if your intro takes 30 or 40 seconds, you can make that first point take two minutes. 
and your second point, your advocacy, can be a short point. You can give some some evidence on what the solution is, and your third point, impact change or outcome, can be almost all theoretical, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, you should have some evidence to back it up, but it's pretty easy to look at the status quo, look at the event that you're advocating for or the solution you're advocating for, and then it's pretty easy to look at how that will impact things. Oh, yeah. Your outcome can be totally hypothetical. I remember talking about problems, questions relating to hunger in Africa, and I'd talk about the establishment of national food or international food banks yeah. that would create a situation where countries in Africa would all create staple foods and then they would send their excess to the food bank and that way they'd be gathering enough of the different kinds of crops that people could all eat. It's something that would probably never happen and something that already does happen, just not in the scale that I was describing. And it was hypothetical, but it's still a solution to the question that was asked. Yeah. So <coughs> these, these are good structures to have when you just don't have enough um, and you want to look at things from a theoretical standpoint. So just to go back over it real quick, the typical speech is your advocacy and then your three main supporting points. If you can't do that or don't want to do that, you can go MEPS, show your advocacy, and then look at it through a moral, economic, political, and societal uh, lens to give a, a really good overall view of it. Or the way Lucas and I prefer is squawk or PSO, the status quo or the um, problem and then move to your advocacy or your solution and then look at how that change or outcome happens. And I personally, I obviously prefer that one, but it's really like Connor suggested. It's all about what makes you most confident because that's going to be key is how believable and confident you are in your position. Confidence is key. Yeah. That goes for all debate, but especially extent. That goes for all facets of life. Yeah. Actually. You want to get that hot GF? Be confident. True facts. Talk talk confidently about the this Chinese snake fighters, and she will just. Whew, <laughs> that's done. Definitely. Talking well, extent, baby. Talking about you and me. I think that I'm gonna cringe when I listen back to this. This pretty well wraps it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Oh, are you? Yeah. Well, dang. Okay. You don't want to hear me sing about Extemp anymore? Not even a little bit. Mm. Well, in that case, uh, this has been the Former Partners Podcast. I'm Quentin. I'm Lucas. And this has been the Extemp episode. Make sure to uh, watch out for the Canterbury's release. That'll be out next week. We will have an episode over the March topic about housing. And we'll have a code for you to get $5 off. Um, we'll be talking more about the recency debate mobile app soon. Um, and we'll have some more stuff for you next week. So I hope you enjoyed this. Give us some feedback. And uh, other than that, thanks, enjoy, and good luck. <laughs> <laughs>